So maybe I'll start off that, um, and if people in the back, please just come to the mics. Um, you know, Mark, I was really uh, struck by your list of the forms you already have post-disclosure. You know, Caesar II is just getting underway. Many of us are returning these results. Uh, but Caesar II, for example, is heavily pediatric. So two questions. Number one, how can we make sure the different consortia are using each other's, you know, forms? Or, you know, if you've already harmonized your metrics, then we should harmonize with you. And then a question that came up in the first session, how are we dealing with uh, NIH-funded projects that are focusing on pediatric population? Great. Thanks. Before I answer the question, I want to make sure that Eric gets credit uh, online for a... Uh, portmanteau, a neologism that almost came out. I think cloud sourcing is a brilliant word, and so I'm going to make sure I add that to my lexicon. So thank you for that, Eric. Um, okay, so in terms of answering the questions, um, we have uh, worked uh, not so much with uh, Caesar II, but with Ignite uh, on trying to uh, uh, generate standardized outcomes uh, across those. And Ignite uh, has a toolkit uh, that will include a repository for uh, outcomes that are being used uh, in um, Emerge, Ignite, and presumably also Caesar too, so that these will be available. I think your point about um, uh, the pediatric aspects uh, is, uh, is appropriate, although um, Emerge does have the advantage, as we heard earlier, that we have some pediatric sites, and uh, they are, in fact, developing pediatric outcomes forms uh, related to that. So we'll at least have a couple of examples, but that's a very important um, uh, thing to note. Uh, so you know, the familial hypercholesterolemia, for example, um, there's now, there is in fact evidence that shows that having the genotype uh, is an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease. And if that's the case, then thinking that that might be due to longitudinal exposure, then a pediatric outcome might be very different. And as a pediatrician, it's embarrassing that we've really not followed through with the lipid measurement uh, recommendations uh, that have been um, put forward by the AAP. So those would be real opportunities to do that. But I think we do have at least a nascent infrastructure in place to be able to share outcomes in a standardized format using a standard uh, red cap um, that would improve generalizability. But right now, we're sort of like the who's in Whoville. Uh, no one knows about it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that the um, eMERGE outcomes have been walked over to CSER by David Veenstra. Yep. Uh, well, it seemed quite quaint to see, to show you, have a, you show a slide where the assessment measures were a click on this PDF and download a piece of paper, um, that, which calls the immediate question of how many of the things on those pieces of paper data collection forms actually already exist in the MR. So if you view outcomes assessment as just another phenotype, so you're just watching for a downstream uh, event to occur. Um, how much of that is already amenable to automation if you put the focus there? So that's a great point, Dan. And I can tell you that uh, behind the scenes, and I didn't go into detail on this, there certainly are uh, several aspects of many of the outcomes forms that will be captured automatically using the phenotype uh, algorithms that, that have been established. Um, it's not as robust as we would like it to be. I would look at this more as a pilot implementation as opposed to something that we know we can do. Uh, but it's uh, another scientific question that I think is very important um, uh, to be able to answer. Um, but the, the reality is, is that, um, you know, most of the quality world still relies on manual review and manual abstraction. There's uh, the, the implementation of automated methods to reliably capture data is still relatively limited. But that is an area where we could definitely explore that as a scientific question. Well, and many people... I think this room is a little bit jaded towards people who actually get all their health care in the same system, you know, and I'm, a, I'm an adult with several chronic medical conditions, and my data is in four different instances of EPIC. So I, I do think we also have to be careful about not generalizing to the real world where many of us, it may be in an EHR, but like, who's EHR? That's why we invented S4S. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Sync for uh, we, science. Great. We've got a bunch of questions lined up. Please go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> I'm uh, Marin Schooner. Can you hear me? Is this thing working? Oh, okay. Oh. I have to hold it? <laughs> you have to sing. 
<laughs> okay, I'll try to figure this out. Uh, so I, I'm a clinical geneticist and a health services researcher at the VA in Los Angeles. I really appreciated the talks. I'm not very familiar with Emerge. I'm one of your external people that was invited today. I have a question about uh, this area of um, clinical utility and cost-effectiveness research. And I was assuming that the clinical intervention here would be the return of results from your testing that's being done. And I was wondering what study designs are under consideration to assess clinical utility and cost-effectiveness. Do you have a comparator within the eMERGE networks? Are, is there a control population, a population of individuals offered testing who haven't up, you know, they, they decided not to pursue it. Might that be a comparator, for example? Or do you have individuals who are genotyped and they haven't received their results? Might that be a comparator? I, I'm just kind of wondering, because how are you going to show that there's really a net health benefit from any of this or from this genetic testing without that comparator group? So, um, so I'll that's say, one of my questions. Okay, you stop then because that's too yeah, much. Yeah, why, why don't we it. start with that? Because there are people yeah. behind you. Yeah, as well. yeah, I'll get to the back of the line. Yeah. So the um, and and I'll ask. I'm going to ask Josh Peterson to make his way to the microphone too because I'd like to get his. If he's still here, I'd like to get his perspective on this as uh, as well. So you'll notice the assiduous absence of anything related to cost effectiveness in the slides that I presented. I said economic outcomes and economic models. We are not configured in such a way to really be able to do cost effectiveness analysis. I'd also push back a bit in the sense that um, um, a health utility is not tied to cost effectiveness, that it's a piece of it. Um, and, but I think we can measure uh, the, you know, what are the health utilities associated with this, which then begs the question, can we afford those health utilities, which is a cost effectiveness question. Um, uh, I did cut a slide for length that uh, Josh developed that uh, began to uh, talk a little bit about how we could use the 25,000 people in uh, eMERGE in that type of a comparator, and I'm gonna, I'd, li I'd like Josh to just comment on that briefly. Be before and I just wanted to state, I wasn't conflating utility with cost effectiveness. I was just kind of responding to the question yeah. which was posed. Yeah. Well, which we, we don't need to argue. I'm just, I'm, I'm yeah. reflecting yeah. what I heard. Okay. So. Yeah, if I could, before Josh jumps in, I just want to add that there are site-specific projects. For example, at our site, we're doing a randomized control trial of family communication. And so half the people will get it, half the people won't get it. And we, we are following outcomes in detail, including cost outcomes. So there are, there's sort of consortium-wide experiments going on and then site-specific. And I think more of the outcome, the, the cost outcomes you might find at the site level. Yeah, I would just add that, uh, as Gail said, there are other uh, sites doing these comparator studies. Mayo is doing one on Cascades uh, screening of FH. And I believe Dr. Green at Harvard is also doing a study where he's giving, disclosing results related to FH, and then a comparator group where they are disclosed after a delay. So, you know, there are site-specific uh, projects um, related to what you just asked. Okay, I think Josh... Yeah, I think some of this has already been answered already, but yeah, you can take advantage of the patients um, that had a negative result to try and subtract out the background rate of some of the health services that are delivered um, to estimate how, for example, with ECGs, which are very commonly ordered, uh, you can look at uh, the patients who had a arrhythmia variant return, look at their ECG rate, and then subtract out the background rate to get an estimate for what's truly related to return of results. So that's, that's one way to do it. But the other way that we're doing it kind of manually is just to look at the documentation and to say, you know, here's a, here's a uh, variant that was returned, and the assessment and plan is, well, here's this variant return. I'm going to order this, 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 and this. And that's a, a clear link. And for a lot of the studies, which are very specialty-oriented, the background rate is extremely tiny, and uh, it, you can be fairly certain that it's related to return of results. So there's a couple ways to try and get at how much of this um, cascaded testing and potential health outcomes related to that um, are associated with the term results. Uh, Great. But, um, I, I guess I just have to say, but the, I think that's not necessarily the issue. I mean, it, it's a matter of you can follow what happens, but 
maybe that all would have happened without those results. But that's what he just, I'm sorry, but that's what he just answered, right? They're looking at people with negative results and they're looking at actions that are extremely unlikely to have occurred otherwise. So I think people are trying to address your question. Okay, Richard. Um, so I think my question is timely. Um, I wanted to make a few, a statement of the obvious and then get to a question. The obvious is, I think that there is a gap between the grand vision and the operational issues that we've all been in, engaged in. That gap needs to be filled by explicit intermediate goals. And the goals surrounding return of results are great, but they're not sufficient to fill out the entire program. And I hope that through the course of the day, we get to some other goals that do map to this intermediate space. I think I see emergence of other grand visions in parallel to this program's grand vision. So the other programs don't satisfy that need. And then at the other end of the spectrum, when I look at the slide I gave to um, Eric Bowinkle, my eyes glaze over. It's very, it's very hard to get people interested in the real uh, nuts and bolts of what the, uh, this program has delivered. And yet these small, uh, very targeted questions that get answered are actually what are driving the, um, the process forward. And so how do we get a program to have intermediate goals that invoke the need to do those nuts and bolts things and still uh, maintain enthusiasm, good science, to still support that uh, bottom level stuff. So my question is, uh, you agree? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so, uh... well, I was just gonna say that that's also the issue for Clingen, um, which is that we have all of these committees, we, we are like, in the weeds trying to generate effective lists of pathogenic variants to then try to address it. It's interesting, people are either really interested in that problem and often work almost for free on that issue, or they are not. So uh, I would agree with Eric's comment about trying to crowdsource the people really interested in variant interpretation to try to help automate that process as much as possible is just one piece of that diagram. And the one problem with that is what's missing is the actual data with which to interpret the variant, right? That's what we need to generate. It's not a matter of, oh, there's not enough people looking at the data. The data doesn't exist. Well, uh, I, I would just push yeah. back a little or bit. That's fair. I, I would push back a little bit. If you look at members of, for example, the ClinGen committees, they often include la people frequently in include uh, people from Invite, from GeneDx, from Ambry. It's really quite amazing, color how many of these tests they're doing. No, I'm talking about the eMERGE space. I'm not right, talking right. about the but entire I'm just saying, field. No, no, but I think that raises an issue for eMERGE, which is a lot of this analysis is going on in the clinical slash private sector. Um, and finding the problems that are specifically good to address in this space compared to what's going on clinically, I think is an important issue. Right, but most of the clinical tests are phenotype directed. The person has the phenotype. So running these tests across people who don't have phenotypes is the way to get at penetrance, right? Or yeah, except for they're all running many more genes than the genes. But they don't have data. Yeah, the clinical data is like, and I would just add one um, additional piece. I think this gets at point I was making in response to Ken in the initial session, which is that, um, you know, this is, what you've pointed out is extremely important, but it's almost never defined within uh, the funding announcements uh, uh, in terms of that this is critical work to be done. And the, um, the way that the proposals are graded, it's about significance and innovation. And this hard work, this heavy lifting that needs to be done to really make sure that there's the coordination, we can move the field forward, is something that doesn't, um, it's not well suited to the type of uh, um, application process that we use. And so that's something that has to be recognized as well. Okay, D Dave's been waiting quite a while. DNA is the sequence is the gift that keeps giving. Yeah, right. So I'm I'm wondering if the programs have looked at ways to re um, re-examine the sequence at intervals after the first sort of session, 
to as so as new risk variants and new disease genes are discovered, they can then that information can then be passed on to the subjects. And also not only how to do that, but how to pay for it. Yes, yeah, so I mean, I think that's something I mentioned as an opportunity and not really being addressed given our sequencing timeline right now that we're getting sequenced, you know, for another year and several months. That doesn't give us a lot of time to reanalyze the sequence till we're at the end of the program. If we had sequence earlier in the program, we could do that, or we could take sequence that was generated an, uh, on a different phase and redo that. And I think it is a really interesting question and an opportunity, but we, it doesn't work with our current timeline very well. And specific to eMERGE, but uh, less relevant to um, uh, programs like uh, CSER, is that you know, we're, we have a specific panel of 109 genes. And so the only thing we'll, we would be able to go back and reanalyze would be information around those 109 genes you know, 68 or of which we understand reasonably well with the obvious uh, issues of penetrance that, that Gail raised. So our opportunity there is limited as opposed to having a full sequence where we would really have, um, you know, whatever um, 22,000 minus 109 is, where we could go back and answer any, uh, literally any question that would come up within the context of a uh, research um, proposal. Dan? So I, I, oh, did you wanted to sort of reiterate what I think I've heard and, uh, and just amplify. So first of all, um, Eric Borwinkle was concerned about whether doctors are going to start to treat genotypes instead of phenotypes. In, in, the, in the electrophysiology world, we, they do that already. And it's really depressing because the interventions are big and ugly. So, and I'll tell you a story offline. But it's sort of, it is, it is really frightening. For the record, I'm not concerned. I just wanted to the group to have the discussion. Well, I'm concerned. <laughs> so so a, a second, a second uh, obvious issue that I, I, I'm not sure has been sort of stated crisply is that if you want to figure out what the phenotypic consequences of a variant that occurs in 10% of the population is, you can do that. And if you want to figure out what the phenotypic consequences of a variant that occurs one in 10 million, you have to have uh, an exotic phenotype or a family. But if you want to figure out what the phenotypic consequences of something that occurs in one in 10,000 people, you can do that in the contexts that we're talking about if your denominator is 100,000 or 500,000 or a million. So that's the advantage of these very large data sets coupled to is the, it, the, you can go back and, and start to get variant interpretation out of the EHR. And we're starting to see that already. And then the, the third, the, the, the last comment I want to make is that Somewhere in, in all of this uh, is, is not a statistical exercise that involves the EHR, but there is actual functional genomics that needs to be coupled into this. So we have variants that you, know, you can characterize in exotic or not so exotic in vitro systems, and coupling that into, into penetrance estimates, rare variant estimates, and then statistical methods to figure out how how to evaluate the contribution of two or three or four or 400 variants to a particular phenotype are outstanding challenges that eMERGE won't necessarily need to or can't necessarily address, nor can all of us, but we have to sort of keep our eye on that particular part of the prize as well. Okay. I think those were more comments and questions. So, Richard, and then I wanted to bring up a different topic. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, very quickly, I just wanted to pick up on Gail's points. Indeed, the design of this phase did... did mean that we had to wait till year four before every single I was dotted and T crossed on every report. But I think we'd be missing an opportunity to say that that only thing we got out of that was a lesson in the next phase, if there's one, to build more sequence data earlier. In fact, right now, we have the opportunity and the part way down the track to freezing two thirds of the data and asking of the group, why can't we annotate it more quickly? and just put it through the narrow portal of the current clinical interpretation mechanism we have now. And if we can work on that and solve it even in the next six months, I think we'll have a completely different complexion to look forward to than we have now. Do you guys, anyone want to comment on that? So I just want to, because we have a couple of other minutes, I, I wanted to bring up what some of you know of my least favorite topic, the ACMG 59. So. Emerge has really focused on it, and the original definition of that list was in a clinical setting, genes for which 
one should consider in an adult returning. And there was a lot of parsing of disease genes where it was thought that a diagnosis might already be known, like NF1, even though it's often missed. And I'm sure there are other examples. Like, so from the point of view of eMERGE, which is really not about actionability of a clinical test necessarily, an incident or secondary finding, is that the best platform? And if you're thinking about eMERGE and beyond, are there other types of lists, just genes with very high penetrance, whether for severe disease, whether or not the diagnosis is already made? I mean, are there other ways to view the genes you would tackle in a similar uh, setting? Yeah, I, I think there's maybe too much focus on the word actionable. I mean, I think that for us, we needed some sort of actionable standard, honestly, to justify to IRBs the patients getting them back. And so the fact that we had consensus across the network that they would that there could be a clinical utility to knowing this information was, you know, was very helpful in saying these are things we can give back. And honestly, we have to give them back to collect the kind of data we want to know about these people when we find these things, particularly as an incidental finding. So I don't think we're trying to compete in the, like, what's an actionable gene list space uh, so much as have agreement to get the same data across all the sites. You know, we want everyone to, to, the, to align to the, to the possibility. So instead of just you know, one site returning familial Mediterranean fever and re phenotyping, which is, I think, what we would have had till they convinced us, go ahead, like, let's just add that one. Um, now we have all the sites doing that, and we're collecting the, the same data for the same genes, and I think that's the opportunity. Yeah, I would just add to that by saying that um, the, the questions that Gail pointed out are, are really important, that the ACMG list was based on, you know, a consensus process uh, of experts, uh, if you want to define the group that sat around the table as experts. Um, I like to think, since I was sitting around the table, that it was an expert group, but it may not be the case. Um, but we had no data, uh, at least in the population. Right, right. Uh, I'm not trying to justify the list. Yeah, I'm asking, yeah. moving into yes. a new network, yes. what kind of genes do I you want think would be interesting? I want the genes <laughs> in the next iteration. See, the problem we had was we knew we had to focus on, on the 56. Well, given that we were going to be on a sequencing platform, that constrained how much additional we could get in there. And so each uh, site was able to nominate genes that they had particular interest in that we thought would, you know, move the science forward. And Terry's looking at me, and I, I know we're just beating a dead horse on this, uh, and I apologize for that. But I think moving forward, um, any compromise off of everything, and whether we define everything as a whole exome or whole genome, um, constrains what we are able to do and constrains to what we currently know as opposed to what we could know. And, and, and really, particularly for the, for the question about reuse, um, it, you know, we look at the exomes that we're generating at Geisinger as being ones that will be there for the entire remainder of that patient's um, uh, life uh, and care at Geisinger. It's an, it's an ongoing resource. And I think even though our projects are, are sort of circumscribed um, in four-year blocks, uh, we shouldn't be thinking about the resource in a four-year block uh, other than some of the pragmatic choices about what we prioritize. Uh, I think the resource needs to be looked at as durable and that individual sites should say, hey, beyond funding, what can we use this for? I think that also goes back to Dave Valley's gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Basically, the inf you know first you have you know inheritance. That's you know one way that there's continued information. The other is you know heart disease patients get cancer later. Cancer patients get heart disease later. So there's longitudinal phenotyping. And the third is the continuous reinterpretation of the sequence. And so at the end of the day, even though it, it's a big swallow today probably more cost effective to think about larger genotyping plat or sequencing platforms and particular targets. Yeah, Marilyn. I'm just looking at hands. Um, I, I think this conversation, and there were a couple of points, maybe the one that Dan made and another one earlier, that one of the other strengths of eMERGE that we've had historically is that we've kind of straddled between discovery and implementation. So we've always had projects that were on the, not the developing or finding evidence about implementation in genomic medicine, but also discovering what are the interesting things that we might want to implement. You know, thinking about polygenic risk scores and how you might use those, or starting to look for gene-environment interactions, which is some of what we'll be doing now with the geocoding. 
But the 109 genes definitely limits our ability for discovery with, with the exception of those 109 genes, which is why a lot of eMERGE sites are still going back to some of the GWAS and the imputed GWAS data that we have so that we can still kind of straddle between discovery and implementation. But I think to, to agree with Mark, you know, in, in the next or future iteration, having all the genes again, and, and I would love to not just have coding regions because what we're learning a lot from epigenome roadmap and ENCODE is how important the regulatory regions are for disease risk. You know, if we still want to continue to straddle discovery and implementation, I think we're going to need more genes in the future. Right, and I would, part of what motivates my question is if you look at illness in adults, I mean, rheumatologic disorders, pulmonary disorders, almost, almost none of those are made up of the current list. And, and one can only imagine that there must be important so, genetic changes that maybe don't mean diagnosis or not, but go back to what you were talking about, severity might mean uh, more severe COT, COPD or not. Yeah, so, I mean, I think obviously the cost equation for this has changed from, you know, four years ago. Um, I, I will say that there was a lot of thought put on the SNV side. What else, you know, the PGX and very, very extensive HLA capturing. For example, we have a very aggressive HLA working group. So, you know, I think that we understood what our limitations were and we got around them to the best uh, that we could at the time. And, and it, hopefully, I, I'm, all, I'm all for a genome too, but I mean, I think there's more. We, there's a focus on the, the 109 things that are getting sequenced, and people tend to forget about all the other stuff that's also on the platform that we're getting. So, so my question is, why do we limit ourselves to sequencing? Even though sequencing <laughs> is something that keeps on giving, there's all kinds of new information coming uh, available for epigenetics that, uh, while that involves sequencing, is a different strategy and is clinically important. Um, I think the uh, looking at methylation or chromatin immunoprecipitation is going to have a, a huge clinical impact uh, and be far more complicated than uh, the germline sequence that we're working with. And so that looks like a future opportunity for us that we seem to be ignoring. Well, I don't know that it's being ignored. Uh, but, John, I would question um, uh, whether, and this is, I think, a viable question for Emerge 4, is whether this is an, uh, this is an appropriate question for Emerge to answer. Um, because, uh, as Marilyn pointed out, um, you know, we're sort of trying to uh, straddle this um, implementation and discovery piece. And I loved Eric's uh, representation of this as a virtuous cycle or even, a, uh, in some ways, a manifestation of a learning healthcare system. Um, that's really important. But in a learning healthcare system, I really don't want stuff that we have ex a very little knowledge about what um, impact it has on the health of the people that I take care of. I recognize that that's important. I recognize it's something that people have to figure out. Um, but my question is whether or not it's Emerge's role to figure that out or whether we should focus more on things that we have a little bit more knowledge about uh, in terms of the clinical um, uh, utility or actionability or whatever term you want to use uh, for that. So it's not an answer, it's just a philosophical question. Go ahead. So I, we're, um, I'm really thrilled that Geisinger and Emerge are sort of working their way through a lot of these things in, a, in advance of our efforts in the VA. We've gotten some considerable pushback from the primary care community. Um, they were offered a uh, um, a, 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 for a project at low cost to do the 59, and they said, well, we don't think there's any clinical utility of, of these at all. Um, and I wonder if um, there's just, I, I, what I, the push that I like here is the, is the, the ability to measure. But I, I, I don't know if I want all the genes returned to everybody all the time, and I think setting some very serious priorities where you, the, the, the big win would be demonstrating that clinical utility question um, and the, even the, the cost efficacy questions in a few select cases that are highly likely. Now, I, you know, when you say um, that, that the penetrance we have is unknown for this cardiomyopathic gene, and so we have to return it to see what happens, sounds a little bit... Um, in a research a, setting. In a, well, I, fair enough, in a, in a research setting, but remember there's clinical consequences, and measuring a process measure, like how many echoes did we do, I'm not sure gives me an answer of did I save any lives or did I help anybody. You know, I have some of the concerns that I think Dan was trying to express that, you know, us cardiologists can't see an echo and not do 
and not not leave it alone if we see something and and then what we'll be doing things that we don't know if we so it's got to be more than just measuring the process measure so I, I think some examples some, some of the key examples where you could really demonstrate a, a big win would go a long way for some of the, the, the skeptics that we're seeing in our clinical community yeah I, I'm, I, I couldn't agree more I mean we need the evidence and I think emerges is developing some of that evidence or other groups that are going to be developing some of that evidence I think I, I just want to uh, clarify one thing that you said. When I say I want everything, I did not say I want to return everything, okay? Uh, that's a very important point. Uh, my job, and, and this I think reflects also my answer to John Harley, which is nothing is going to touch my patients unless it reaches a certain threshold of um, this is relevant to them. And that could mean a clinical threshold, which is to say, I know enough about this, BRCA1, that I know exactly what to do clinically. Or it could be, as Gail pointed out, in a clinical research setting to say, we really don't know enough about cardiomyopathy or long QT. There are research questions that need to be answered around this uh, that we need to do. But anything that's not that proximate, um, that needs to be kept away from our patients and our providers because uh, it's just going to distract. And as you say, when a clinician gets something, they, 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 you know, it's act or not act. There is no try, right? You have to do something or not do something. And I think we're predisposed to do something just because of the concerns about liability and, and, and things of that nature. That's a simplistic explanation. Um, so I think well, that uh, you know that to me is 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 where it sits, and what it really requires in in something like eMERGE is to really say we are going to have to define the threshold above which we think this is something that could be studyable within an eMERGE project. Right, but I would point out that there are genes on that list where there are good data that Lynch is probably the best example, where there are adults who were screened and had lower cancer mortality than groups that weren't. There are, BRCA1, there are very good studies that show that BRCA1 carriers who've had uvarectomies have lower mortality from cancer than those who don't. So I think the list is very long, and I think what may get muddied is that there are much rarer genes and genes for which we know less. Um, and then genes, and I know University of North Carolina, for example, has picked a much smaller list. I forget, it's like 10 genes that they've tried to do projects showing population screening would be effective. I mean, that's a project goal. So I do think it's important when we're talking to clinicians that we do make clear the range of evidence around each of those genes. Yeah, it's no, I can, huge. I completely agree. I mean, but, that, that, I mean, I, but we do need to measure that, as, even yes. those, in, in those settings. I mean, there's, there's an Air Force project that took a Coriel platform, returned the genes. Uh, they returned 44,000 results to 4,000 people, 11 per person. Wow. They had a woman almost scheduled for a double mastectomy because she had a... a BUS. A, she, she had a... a uh, there, these were, this was not BRCA1 and 2 until someone finally said, wait a minute, we have no idea what this means for you. Right. So we, we, need to, we need to measure it. And you know, then it also begs the question in other areas. I mean, I calculate a BMI that a patient doesn't know. That tells you more information about their diabetes risk than, than uh, uh, a single um, uh, variant. Right. And, do, I, do I have to return that too? Yeah. I mean, I, do you know what I mean? I, I think it's... It, it, I'm, I'm, and I'm, you do. You're just going to say, say think, it's a BMI. I think that um, I, I think that we're missing a very important thing, which is that this list of genes was supposed to be high penetrance, and likely pathogenic was supposed to mean 90% chance or more of being penetrant, and our data is showing wrong and wrong. Okay, and so that makes it very valuable data. So we didn't go out to abuse the patients. We went out with something we thought was going to be useful. We're learning it's not so useful. Incredibly critical data. Absolutely, yeah. I completely agree. That, yeah. that, that, yeah. that penetrance information is vital. Yeah. Okay, and, and so I, I'm going to cut you off because there's someone who's been waiting, and I think maybe the last two questions. Uh, hi, this is Ali Garavi from Columbia. I just wanted to uh, say, Mark, I agree with your assessment that we do need to look at the entire everything, whatever how you want to define it, because if we want to be at the leading edge to implement, you know, so the, to, if the science and implementation, we have to do this. That's clearly the price point is there, and other sites are doing it. Your group is doing it. Uh, and also the patients are getting these data as well. So people are kind of getting this on the commercial side. So we have an opportunity to develop the uh, sort of the, the, the basis for returning these results and looking at the outcomes. 
I think the other opportunity is to also engage other um, constituencies here. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the payers are the people who also need to be engaged in looking at these outcomes. And so we can also work with CSER and other consortia who are engaging payers uh, in that uh, as we try to define what outcomes we're trying to look at. Uh, such as, and also regulatory agencies, for example, the FDA, uh, when we're looking at the impact and the outcomes for genomic data. Uh, and so that's, I think, another opportunity to also interact with the community uh, and engage all of us and other NHGRI networks. Great. And do you have a brief comment or statement behind you? Oh, that's it. Yeah, uh, Eric Larson, uh, colleague of Gales, and just want to pick up on Gales' observation and Dan's and Eric's, the other Eric, or one of three or four Eric's, I think, in the room. Uh, Evidence, what, what is the source of the evidence? I think that's so important. And what I think Gail was saying was when you look in a, in a, in a population-based uh, sample as opposed to a convenience sample, you can get very different results. And, and I think one of the challenges that, that the field and all of us need to ask ourselves is how can we understand the, the different results we've gotten when we've looked at different populations? And I'd, I'd invite any of the panelists to think about as we implement, we're going to be implementing to a population, and it's going to be population management. How does the evidence generation affect that beyond the virtuous cycle, which I, I believe in very much, but if we don't have the right source of the information, uh, we may get ourselves into trouble. I think the first thing is you have to know, you have to know the source of the information and be aware of the source and be aware that if you apply inference from one source to a second source, you may be misled. Okay, last question. Okay, if I may, I have a very brief comment. It's just in response to the Okay, please comments. introduce yourself and you're going to have to hold the mic. We yeah. can't hear you. Okay, um, actually, I, I was saying that I have a very brief comment. I'm the representative from FDA, so this is to address the previous comment that we are trying to work with the merge and strongly we uh, probably could provide you more details. And uh, the goal is to clarify pharmacoepidemiologic and pharmacogenetic applications and, uh, and to develop what we call in silico biomarker discovery, methodology for in silico biomarker discovery, uh, with the biomarkers being uh, applicable to clinical and regulatory studies. And I would be glad to provide more details. Thank you. Great, thank you.